Cool. Uh, next up is uh, Paul Flemens from the Australian Museum. And Paul will be talking, well, Paul's talk is entitled Can Buy the First Data Scientist Documenteer. Document volunteer and professional collaborations and contributions in the biodiversity enterprise. The floor is yours, Paul. Thanks, Niels. Um, I'm uh, presenting on behalf of a bit of a collaboration between the ALA, uh, Notes from Nature, and the Australian Museum, and uh, Robert Stevenson. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. Um, we're either meeting on here today or people from around the country, wherever they are. Um, and pay my respect to the culture and identity uh, which has been built bound up with the land and um, I'd like to pay respects my respects to elders past present uh, and emerging now cool it's working it's working on my laptop would be good too uh, today I want to talk about the biodiversity enterprise or BE um, and how we value and recognise the contribution of citizen science to the biodiversity enterprise. Uh, the BE is a term that Robert Stevenson introduced me to, and uh, it broadly refers to the activities, resources and infrastructure that constitute the biodiversity data life cycle that we are all involved in uh, through TADWIC. So it includes data capture, um, data collection and management, data aggregation through GBIF and ALA, and things like research, policy, education, et cetera, that uses that data. Um, citizen science, that's the, the definition of citizen science from the Australian Citizen Science Association. I just thought I'd re-familiarise ourselves. I'm sure you're all aware of that, although I know um, citizen has some implications in the States which make it a little bit uh, controversial, but I will avoid that conversation. Uh, there we go. Okay, in terms of um, where citizen science is involved in the, the biodiversity enterprise, uh, from where I'm standing, uh, it's mostly in the data capture phase and um, the, the research, research policy education area. Um, that's sort of, yeah, uh, the primary areas that um, citizen science is involved in. Now, in terms of Valuing and recognising citizen science uh, is really important because the BE desperately needs citizen science and citizen science needs funding and support to make the most of it and to, to get the best out of it. So how do we understand and communicate the value of citizen science? And this is just an indication of how important citizen science is to the BE. This is GBIF records um, from data sets and uh, the first four there, I think, are citizen science projects. Uh, eBird being the one at the top there, which is the, the really significant contributor there. But yeah, huge uh, contribution that citizen science is making to GBIF's data. Uh, three examples of SITSI um, uh, contributions uh, to the BE are through field observations, things like eBird, camera trap IDs, where camera traps put online and, and um, crowdsourcing uh, is used to identify animals in the images. Uh, or whether there's animals in the images, and label transcriptions, which is classic um, label transcriptions of collections from museums, etc. Um, citing these, so he, here's some examples of numbers of field observations from eBird and iNaturalist, and that is, that's a billion there, that's one billion, not one million, so, um, and 72 million from iNaturalist, they're from GBIF recently. And citing these numbers of data points is convenient, and it's a relatively simple measure that is pretty damn impressive, but it's a bit hard to really grasp what it really means in the terms of effort and value. Oh, sorry, I, I'm reading here, but I haven't moved on. There we go. They're the numbers, so that's a billion. Uh, in terms of camera trap IDs, um, this is my uh, one of the projects from the Australian Museum is Digivol, and we've got a project in that called Wildlife Spotter, which is for uh, crowdsourcing to identify uh, animals in images. And 4 million, that's just one example of uh, projects around the world. Uh, there's 4 million images uh, classified through, through Digivol. Label transcriptions, Digivol, again, 860,000 label transcriptions on Digivol, 4 million, nearly 5 million on notes from nature. So as you can see, there's multiple ways in which citizen science is contributing. Uh, they're just some really simple projects, examples. Now, um, as I mentioned, it's a bit hard to get your head around what that actually means. 
to get a better idea of what the contribution of SITSI is, we need to look at things which we can relate to more directly in terms of value. And to me, that's time and money. Um, so I've chosen two projects that I'm very familiar with I, that I run through the Australian Museum. It's Frog ID and Digivol. So I want to have a closer look at um, what sort of uh, value we get from our citizen science projects. Sorry, come here. Apologies. Okay. So Frog ID involves uh, citizen scientists going out in the field and recording frog calls into their mobile phone, submitted to the Australian Museum where we have um, experts identify those frogs. We're working on AI being involved in that as well, but at this stage, it's uh, that's how it works. And so um, if you looked at, for, for museums, uh, recollection is one way of uh, valuing our collections and uh, the Australian Museum uh, we have a figure which um, of $147 per specimen across the collections for recollection. Uh, that's for cost of getting to the survey location, accommodation, time taken for the observation, etc. So if you looked at the Frog ID records, which are audio calls, which aren't quite as good as a specimen, but they're pretty good because you can identify the species, etc. from that, you can revisit them, database them, etc. You're looking at around $139 million dollars contributed by citizen scientists for recollection of that data. Now, this is all up for debate, if you want to debate the details of that and how I get to that, but it's trying to give you an idea of how much citizen science is contributing in terms of value. And, I, and uh, camera trap IDs, uh, how might you value that? The salary cost for an equivalent hourly rate of a technical officer to go through all those camera trap images and identify them. And uh, if you look at, oh, sorry. So if, you're, if you look at um, uh, Digivol uh, Wildlife Spotter, we've had 7,000 volunteers working in Wildlife Spotter, 4 million tasks, um, sorry, 4 million camera trap images over each image is classified four or five times, uh, 33 seconds per task, time contributed 149,000 hours, value $6.5 million, that's by volunteers. So this is trying to put a value around um, citizen science contributions. Label transcriptions, uh, salary cost, again, equivalent hourly rate of a TO here in Australia to do image capture, transcribing and classifying. <clears throat> so in the Digivol lab, we have people that come to the Australian Museum, volunteers, and they take images of the specimens, 60 volunteers a week, 155,000 specimens, uh, around 24,000 hours, 13 work years, that is, person work, work time around a million dollars through volunteer contributions. Online, transcription validation, you end up with a full record, 3.5, I'm going, time-wise I'm going, okay, um, $3.5 million. So you're getting an understanding now of the, the sort of the, the size of the contributions in terms of um, monetary value. In terms of non-science values that citizen science brings, to us. We've got education, increased science literacy and advocacy, advocacy by being involved in citizen science projects. Uh, there's the engagement aspects of health, uh, both physical and mental, in being um, involved in citizen science projects. How do you put a value on those? How do we know how much value citizen science is bringing to uh, the community through that? Um, so that's sort of trying to pitch paint a picture of how much uh, citizen science contributes to the BE. Um, how do we recognise citizen science? I don't think we're doing a good enough job of recognising citizen science. Who should we be recognising? Individuals, they're the doers. Projects uh, and platforms such as um, eBird, Digivol, Notes from Nature, they're the enablers. And citizen science is the discipline that unites and empowers the doers and enablers. Current standards, how do we recognise them using our current standards? Recorded by is generally one that's pointed out to me as the way of recognising individuals and projects, etc. But really, there's so many different uh, entities that could be in recorded by that it's not really a, an effective way of, um, of giving credit to citizen science, individuals or projects. Um, data set name is another one. A lot of the, the platforms will recognise individual projects, etc., through data set name, but there's uh, multiple levels at which that can happen as well. And really there's no catch-all for citizen science as a discipline. So, um, yeah, I'm, my point I guess I'm making there is that we need to do better at recognising 
something that contributes so much to the biodiversity enterprise. How could we do better? Um, communities of practice that use that recommend how to use the existing standards is one way of looking at that. I think we need to look at more at um, standards that actually specifically give us a way of recognising individuals, projects, platforms, and citizen science as a whole. And I'm running out of time. I've got a few minutes left, but um, and that's not even talking about the cost of running citizen science projects, which I'm not going to go into today. It's uh, sort of watch this space thing, but of course, in the contributions that citizen scientists and citizen science makes to the biodiversity enterprise is, is a benefit, but then we've also got to run citizen science projects and that, that can uh, be a significant cost as well. Anyway, that's, the, that's what, all I wanted to talk about today. Thank you. And I'd just, just like to uh, note, notes from Nature and Digibol in this, uh, at Civil Living Australia helped me pull together the data for this talk. Thanks very much, Paul. Any questions? Steve? Nothing online. Any questions from the room? There's one up there in the corner. This. Over there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your presentation. Sophie Pamelon from Jamie France. Uh, it's not really a question, but in France, we've had several citizen science projects that has been uh, have been um, uh, enhanced by uh, data papers. So I think it's a good way to describe the project and to acknowledge the work done by the volunteers. So that uh, data papers are uh, really a good, op good option to uh, thank the people involved in the biodiversity data collecting. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> Paul. Um, when I was with the Atlas of Living Australia, citizen science was almost considered to be second rate uh, as a view from professional scientists. How have you seen that evolve over the last 18 years? Um, I guess the, the project I, I choose mostly is, uh, to experience over that time is, is Frog ID, which is... Uh, uses citizen science and combined with um, experts at the Australian Museum. Um, and there's 20 scientific papers that have come out of that single project. Uh, and in the big scheme of things, compared to eBird or whatever, it's not a huge project, but 20 significant scientific papers, and it's being uh, referred to in a lot of policy and management documents at both state and federal level that Frog ID should be used for monitoring, et cetera. So... Um, yeah, that's that's an ex one example, but there's lots of projects that are being uh, designed to effectively use citizen scientists in the best way possible. Um, and um, I think science. I think Jody Roll Jody Rowley, when she started out with Frog ID, uh, was all about the data and didn't think much of citizen science. She wasn't sure it would work, etc. And now she's like she's a, a devotee of um, the process and the people that get involved in the project and. Um, so I guess uh, design of projects has come a long way, I think. Uh, focus on making sure the accuracy of data is, is managed in a way that um, means the project has really good scientific outcomes. Um, so I guess that's, that's how I'd see it, the, the, the design of the project so as the science outcomes are, uh, deal with the issues of people, people concerned around data accuracy. Hi, my name is Yuan Liliulon from the Swedish Species Observation System, so Arkwart Island. You, so I just comment that one month ago we uh, celebrated 100 million records. Wow. So yeah. yeah, that's You that's can impressive. update your slide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Next speaker up is Nikki Nicholson from the Royal Botanic Gardens. 